Good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz. I'm our Senior Vice President for External Relations here and I am absolutely thrilled and honored to uh, be hosting this book event for one of my favorite reporters in town, Jeff Dyer. Um, Jeff, as you know, uh, is a uh, senior uh, foreign affairs reporter for the Financial Times, which, you know, I, I don't know about you all, but every day I've got three newspapers on my desk. One of them is the Financial Times, and that's what I start with. Second is the New York Times, the third is the Wall Street Journal, and I read the post online. But if you really want to know what's going on in the world, you need to read the Financial Times. And if you really want to know what's going on in foreign policy in Washington, you need to read Jeff Dyer. This is a fantastic book, um, and I hope all of you will buy um, several copies <laughs> after the event. <laughs> Jeff will be happy to sign them. Um, we, uh, we're, we're, we're perp right here and now, we can, sim we can if, we buy, if you buy more than one book, we can push Jeff to the bestseller list <laughs> on the New York Times. So just think about that, they're great gifts. Um, Chris Johnson is our, uh, our uh, chair, Freeman Chair in China Studies. Um, Chris is uh, one of the great experts in the world on China. Um, and, you know, I know this because he gets to brief a guy named Henry Kissinger every once in a while. <laughs> Um, in addition, um, Chris has really led us into a whole new territory of China studies, and we're really grateful for that. We're grateful for you being here. Um, this event will also be posted on our website uh, after the fact. If you'd like to refer back to it, the video will be up. Um, and again, uh, thanks for coming to CSIS. And with that, I'm going to uh, give it to my colleague, Chris Johnson, who's going to begin the discussion. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. Um, it's uh, fantastic to be here. We're really excited to have the opportunity to host Jeff and uh, have him uh, kind of give us some insight on his book and what he's thinking, ask him a few questions, and then obviously we want to hear from the audience as well and, and have a good dialogue with you guys. Uh, let's get the boring bio stuff out of the way. Uh, Jeff's worked for the Financial Times for over a decade in China, Brazil, the UK, and now the US. He was the FT's bureau chief in Beijing from 2008 to 2011, uh, following three years working for the paper in Shanghai. He has also been the paper's Brazil bureau chief and covered the healthcare industry, where he wrote extensively about the AIDS epidemic in Africa and Asia. He recently took up a position in the DC Bureau, writing about American foreign policy, uh, studied at Emmanuel College, Cambridge University, and at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Bologna and Washington, DC, where he was supported by a Fulbright Award. And Jeff is also a great personal friend of mine. Uh, I deal with him on a regular basis. I find him to be one of the best journalists uh, here in town or anywhere else uh, to, to be dealing with. Let me just say a few quick words, and then Jeff's going to uh, provide us some overview uh, about the book, The Contest of the Century, available, as Andrew said, outside. <laughs> um, you know, I love this book as sort of a, a corollary or, or the second half to a, a book that his colleague, Richard McGregor, wrote uh, a couple years ago called The Party which looked at the internal uh, side of the Chinese sort of system and reminded us all that uh, in the same way that Bill Clinton once said, it's the economy stupid, in China, it's the party stupid. And uh, I think we're seeing this very, very clearly under Xi Jinping and the rest of the new Chinese leadership. And I think what Jeff has tried to do with the book is provide us with a similar look uh, at the for sort of foreign policy strategy from the Chinese point of view and also what this means for the Sino-US relationship. And I particularly value the book because it is both written in a very approachable, almost breezy journalistic style, but also has really deep uh, substantive content and research. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Uh, he's going to give some opening remarks. I'll ask him a few questions, and then we'll throw it open to you in the audience uh, to continue the discussion. Jeff, please. Uh, well, Chris, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Andrew, for that embarrassing introduction. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And thank you very much to CSAS for, for having me here today. It's, um, it's both funny and a little bit intimidating to be here today. The funny part is that when I first started to think about this book and I was put in touch with a very good agent, um, and I was trying to ask her, you know, I have these ideas, but I want to pitch them in a way that will be accessible to a general readership. The Financial Times is a, is a slightly exclusive product with a slightly elite readership, and the, you, know, you actually want to sell some books when you write a book. So I asked her for her advice, and she was a very experienced agent. She'd run a big agency in New York, so she knows the US market, and she'd run this agency in the, she runs this agency in the UK as well. And the one that she said to me the following, she said, when you sit down to write this book, there's one piece of advice that I really want you to follow. Whatever you do, you're not writing for one of those bloody Washington think tanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here I am. Um, uh, 
intimidating because it's a golden rule of journalism that you should never appear on a stage or in front of an audience of people who know a lot more about the subject matter than you do. So I'm breaking all the rules here, <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna, gonna plunge in. I'm just gonna um, briefly outline for 10 minutes or so a couple of the main points in the book. Um, probably not things that are hugely surprising to a Washington audience, but I think they're still very important points. The first one is that what I've, one of the things I've tried to do in the book is get over the sense of the way and I think that China has changed quite profoundly in the last five years or so. The way that, the way that China thinks about its role in the world has started to change. This transition that I've described that China's made from this country that was keeping its head down and concentrating just on growing its economy to a country that now wants to actually start throwing its weight around, influence events, shaping events, behaving much more like a great power. It's obviously, it's not a transition that happens overnight. These pressures and ambitions and ideas have been you know, present in China for a long time. But I think there are important reasons as to why they've really started to come to a head, I would say, from the, the 2008, 2009 period. I think the financial crisis was a hugely important event uh, in China, not just for economic reasons, but for broader psychological reasons almost. It had a very strong psychological impact on the way China thinks about itself. Uh, this idea that the U.S. is in decline became very prominent. It was very strong in 2009, 2010, but it's still, to some extent, a, a strong idea amongst the Chinese elite. And this brought forward this whole idea that, you know, now is our time. We need to start standing up for ourselves. And in a sense, there had always been an argument within China about what we will do the day we become powerful. Uh, the Chinese hawks, if you like, suggested that you know, we will eventually have to challenge the US, we'll have to stand up to the US, we'll have to push back in all sorts of ways against the US. And the more dovish people in China said, you know, the best way for us to pursue our interests is to integrate within the global economy, is to play by the rules that the US has established for the global system. This argument was always happening, but what the financial crisis did is it brought it very much to the fore. It brought it to the forefront, it made it about the now and the present, not some theoretical discussion about the future. And that doesn't mean to say that the hawks, if you like, have won, but it does mean that something that's very much going on the here and now at the top levels of power in China. And the second, second part of that is pressure from below within the system, uh, particularly in the form of this very visceral nationalism that, that you sometimes see in China. And a whole series of the last decade of these spurts of emotional anger, if you like, of, of this very kind of visceral internet-based nationalism. Incredibly anti-Japanese, but also in lots of ways very skeptical about the US. And that, that has in its own way, if it, if it hasn't necessarily forced the, the government to take certain positions, it's made it much harder for them to back down in certain situations, much harder for them to compromise. So again, another factor that's just pushing the country to have a slightly more ambitious and more aggressive almost foreign policy. And at the same time, I think you've also seen what I describe as something of a fracturing of power. That's very much not the same as a liberalization, but what it means is that power has dispersed in some ways from the very top leaders throughout the, the, the kind of top levels of the system. So you've had big state-owned companies, for instance, have been the prime drivers behind China's uh, engagement with Sudan, which has become a very difficult controversial issue. Or a local government in Yunnan has been one of the main drivers behind China's investments and engagement in Myanmar, which has become another very controversial issue. And then you have the military itself, which, I mean, it's desperately hard to uh, actually define where, what the role of the military is and how it relates to the party. And we could probably, Chris could probably talk about it with you all night. But there have been these few glimpses we've had in the few years of a military that's getting more restive, more assertive, and wants to, wants to have more of its say. It's had this huge increase in its budget in the last two decades, and so it's entirely natural that the military would want to use some of those resources. It would want to actually be able to mobilize some of that power that's accumulated to try and shape events. And there's an interesting thing that's very much happened since I've finished the book is, of course, that Xi Jinping is trying to reverse a lot of that fracturing of power. He's trying to sort of reassert himself as not quite a strong man, but as very much as the decisive leader at the top of the system who's pulling back in some of that power that's dispersed and down the ranks. Um, and that's going to be one of the fascinating things to watch over the next few years is whether he's actually able to do that or not. Um, but a subset of that is his relationship with the military. Uh, it's not at all clear, but will be one of the key questions, I think, whether Xi Jinping is the guy who controls the military or whether he channels some of the military's instincts. And that's still, I think, very much an open question. And so the way I would frame it is it's often asked, particularly in Washington, is China a revisionist power or is it a status quo power? And clearly there are elements of both here, but I think the, the better way to understand it is that China's behaving now like a great power. This is what big, important countries do when they become powerful. They try and shape events to their own interests. 
There might be things that China is doing that people might be disturbed about or worried about, but that we shouldn't be surprised that China is beginning to behave this way. This is an entirely natural thing for a big, important country to do. It's what history has shown us lots of other countries do when they accumulate the kind of resources and power uh, and economic interests that China has. So that's the, the first argument. The second one I tried to put forward is that uh, China will actually struggle in lots of ways to push back against the US, even in the ways that it's trying to. Uh, my rather vainglorious subtitle is how America can win. But what I mean by that is it's going to be very tricky in lots of ways for China to really uh, you know, dethrone the kind of central role that the US has in, in the international system. And just to give a few of the examples of what I mean by that, in soft power, China has invested huge amounts of money in the last few years in soft power. It's almost like an obsession in the Chinese system. They've really embraced the idea much more than almost any other country in the world. But they're constantly undermined by the way that China itself treats its own more awkward citizens, the sort of artists and film directors and activists, and the kind of people who would be precisely the sorts of members of society who might be able to generate soft power to change the way people think about China, are often the people who find themselves absolutely against the sharp end of the way the system works. So it's, it's kind of undermined itself in that way. Uh, and economic issues, and one of the most important ones is the way that China is trying to change the status of its currency, trying to develop the currency into being a potential challenger to the dollar, to being an international reserve currency, which has economic benefits for Chinese companies, but also there's a strong political agenda as well to slowly chip it away at the role that the US dollar has enjoyed. But that's also going to be incredibly hard for China to really mobilize that, because to do so, it's going to have to introduce root and branch reforms of the way the economy works, and especially the way the financial system works, and especially the way the Communist Party controls the financial system. So that's another one that's going to be very hard. But the biggest one, that, and there's one that's you know, obviously drawn the most attention in Washington, is the way that China's military buildup is now starting to affect the balance of power and politics within the region. Um, all those obscure disputes about uninhabited islands that we're constantly hearing about. Um, and you know, clearly, China does have a much more muscular military. Clearly, the long-term trends, some of the long-term trends are very much in its favor. But even then, I still think that there are powerful advantages that the US still has that will, again, uh, make it very hard for China really to, to you know, restore that kind of central role in Asian affairs that historically is enjoyed. And the biggest one of, one of those is that most of other Asian countries still want the kind of Asia that the US wants. The US is very much pushing against an open door in Asia. If this was just about the US against China, the US would, would clearly lose in the sense that it's 8,000 miles away. But there is a very favorable potential balance of power pushing the US's direction because most countries still want an Asia that's uh, based upon trade across the Pacific. They want freedom of navigation. And they want a system where countries are not bullied and pushed around every time they have a dispute with a powerful country like China. So that gives the US a very strong opportunity over the next couple of decades to, to construct alliances and build on existing alliances and construct partnerships that will instill those kinds of rules and allow it to insulate the region from maybe some of the more potentially destructive aspects of, of what a powerful China could potentially entail. Um, and that really goes to the sort of underlying truth about the central role the US has enjoyed in the, in the world affairs since the end of the Second World War. It's not just about the power of the US military. It's about the fact that so many other countries buy into these underlying ideas. Uh, that they believe that the US-led order actually benefits them. That's why it's so resilient. It's not just about those 11 aircraft carriers. And then finally, you know, I don't want to sound too Pollyannish, so I'll just throw out a few of the kind of major problems that clearly the US is facing, and then maybe these are some of the things we can, we can talk about. The obvious one is the US is finding very hard to respond to this idea of Chinese salami slicing, the idea of this is very incremental, slow, patient ways in which China is gradually exerting some greater control over the seas around it. We've seen the classic case being the way that China was able to take control of the Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines two years ago. Now, clearly, people here are very worried about it. They haven't really found a res response. But I would suggest it's slightly less of a really kind of fundamental problem than maybe some people suggest, for the simple reason that it seems to be a, a very effective Chinese strategy against a country like the Philippines that really doesn't have the resources and muscle to push back against China. But it's much less effective against Japan or even Vietnam that does have some of those resources. So in order for China to push those countries around, it's going to have to take much more aggressive, offensive steps that will, get, that will be much more damaging to its reputation and damaging to its broader interests. 
So I think that the salami slicing, it's a genuine issue for the Philippines, but it's slightly less of a, of a winning strategy for China when it comes to some of these other countries. Uh, <clears throat> the other, one other big issue the US is clearly facing is just this whole idea of focus. Um, the underlying idea of the, the pivot was really about staying power. It's about the US trying to impress upon the region that we're not going anywhere. We see our long-term future as absolutely rooted in Asia, and we are here to stay. And that was a very effective, powerful idea in 2011, 2012. But then already we've seen in 2013 just how easy it is for the US to get distracted. Um, my, my, my job is to write about US foreign policy. There was a moment last year when I almost changed my business card to Middle East correspondent, <laughs> because that is just the nature of, the nature of Washington, as you, as you find out when you come here. It's about time. It's about agenda. It's about the urgent pushing out the important. Um, and already there is this feeling that even though the administration absolutely denies it, there's a profound sense within Asia that the US has already got distracted, is all too focused on the Middle East, and it's kind of taken its eye off the ball on Asia. And so it allows the Chinese to say, quite convincingly, you, you can't maybe rely on these people. They have too many, uh, they're, they're involved in too many other issues, and you think they're going to be there to back you up, but actually their focus has already drifted elsewhere. <clears throat> and then the final issue is that's going to be very hard for the US to articulate is, is an economic strategy that really links the US into Asia in the long term. We've seen that you know, very practically with TPP in the way that uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, Congress has suggested it's not going to do very much on TPP. And just as, as an aside, I mean, I've been doing a couple of radio events connected to my book, astonishing number of calls about TPP. Huh. And a couple of those events, almost half the calls about TPP. Even in the last couple of months, it feels as if TPP has, has really come to life as a political issue. Um, and it almost feels as if the administration has maybe lost the debate already, even before mm. it's really had a chance to articulate it. Mm. So when, you know, when Harry Reid comes out and says, we're not going to touch fast track status for trade negotiations, he knows what he's talking about. He's, he's obviously seen that, felt that as well. He's, he's sensed the way that it's become a kind of hot button issue, and almost all the calls are deeply against it. Mm. But it's not just about TPP, it's about a broader sense about the US seeing its economic futures intimately linked to Asia's future. And if you're thinking about a strategy to revive manufacturing and double exports and boost middle class salaries, that clearly has to involve Asia in a fundamental way because that's where the fastest growing big markets are going to be. But that's very hard for a US politician, for a US administration to articulate at the moment because there's so much broad pessimism about globalization, about trade deals, and the sense that the US has been at the losing end of some of these deals in the past. But that, that ultimately has to be the root of what a US strategy is going to be in Asia, because it can't just be about security. It can't just be about having some aircraft carriers that come in when there's a crisis. It has to also be about the US being economically relevant to Asia's future and Asia being relevant to America's. But that's going to be very hard to do. So I'm going to leave it there, um, and then we'll open up to, to questions. Sure. Uh, plenty of food for thought there. Yeah. Uh, just for those of you who are standing, there are a few empty seats up front if you'd like to come up and sit down, feel free to do so. Uh, this is a great opportunity to, to, as the think tanker, to be questioning the journalists. So <laughs> very much enjoying that opportunity. Uh, one of your kind of key assertions, I think, in the book is that struck me was the difference in political strategy uh, between a rising China, right, and a China that has effectively risen or is well on its way to, to rising. Um, can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit for the audience and kind of tell us what you think the core differences are and then um, you know, what it all means, basically. You mean the, the strategy that it was adopting, say, a decade ago? Right, so the kind of Biden hide shifting to, you know, something else. Um, well, you know, from the, particularly from the period of 97 to about 2008, China had an incredibly effective strategy, especially in Asia, uh, sometimes, you know, framed in the terms of the Deng Xiaoping's famous advice about you know, nourishing obscurity and biding your time, but sometimes also described as the charm offensive. And the basic idea was that China wanted to present a very, very unthreatening image to its neighbors to say, you have nothing to fear by our rise. All we want is to develop our economy. All we want is the mutual prosperity, and you shouldn't be alarmed by us. That w worked like a charm in lots of many ways. It was very effective after the Asia crisis when there was a huge amount of resentment towards the US, but it also worked effectively throughout the next decade. And you could sense, particularly in the middle of the 2000s, there was a moment where it was genuinely possible to speculate about the US being pushed out of Asia. All across the region, you could see political wobbling about the, the alliances that various countries had with the US in South Korea and Japan and the Philippines, even somewhere like Australia, which has been the rock-solid US ally. But the problem that China's had is with this, 
this new, if you like, more ambitious, assertive, aggressive strategy since 2008 that really now has, has two different approaches that are contradicting each other. It still believes in this idea of the charm offensive, that it wants to you know, link economically with its neighbors and be an engine of prosperity for the region. It still sees that as a fundamental part of its, its strategy and its game plan for Asia. But at the same time, it has this more ambitious military strategy where it's trying to push its weight around in some of these territorial disputes, build a military that slowly and surely pushes the US further out into the Pacific. And those two strategies are very contradictory because the harder that China pushes on these territorial issues, the harder that China maybe pushes against the US, the more it alarms its neighbors and pushes them into the arms of the US and undermines that whole charm offensive approach about creating goodwill through economic links. Yeah. Um, and kind of on that note, I mean, you, you also sort of suggest in the book that uh, the US must periodically push back uh, when China sort of tests U.S. global preeminence in terms of the international system, you know, and so on. Um, and, you know, you talked about this a little bit in your opening remarks, the challenges the U.S. faces in trying to, to get that right. Um, one, are there kind of specific areas that you see as the most likely realms where the U.S. may have to do some of this more assertive messaging? And then two, uh, you are the foreign affairs correspondent here. How do you think the administration is doing on this task, both from your perspective here sitting in Washington and then just kind of what you pick up uh, how the region is reacting. Well, I think on some of these issues, you know, the U.S. doesn't actually need to push back. It just needs to hold its nerve in right. a sense. There is no special reason to be worried about the Chinese soft power offensive. I don't right. think that's going to be very effective. Yeah. And I don't think that the, the, the renminbi is going to dramatically undermine the U.S. dollar. Mm. Unless, of course, the U.S. were sort to default on the debt. <laughs> so you know, that would be a basic recommendation would be not to, not to do that. Um, <laughs> but it. obviously, the, yeah, yeah, not to self. Um, but obviously, the, you know, the, the, the clear and very difficult one is on these military issues, is on the whole salami slicing. It's on this Chinese push to slowly and incrementally gain greater control and dominance over, over some of these maritime areas. And clearly, that's a very, very difficult one for the administration to thread. It needs to be firm, and firm enough to, to push back against some of these Chinese ambitions, but not so firm that it will rattle some of its allies and friends in the region, and not so firm that it will you know, dramatically stimulate some of the hawks in China and set off a kind of Cold War arms race type dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly, the administration you know, hasn't quite found the way to do that. So mm -hmm. we saw with the, the AIDS situation at the end of last year, mm -hmm. you know, they came on very firmly right. at first with uh, you know, sending a couple of B-52s through, through the region. But then the message all got very muddled when they said to civilian airlines that actually you, know, Europe, you should abide by these rules. And so it gave this very confused message both to the Chinese and, and both to some of their allies in the region. Mm. And it's entirely possible that people in China think that they won a, a tactical victory with mm. that, that they you know, advanced their claim a little bit and they saw them some dissent between the US and Japan. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, there's no magic formula here, but it is uh, it j just a, sort of a generalized issue that the US has to be, find a way of being firm, but not too assertive or too aggressive in the way it pushes back. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then also you kind of talk in the book about uh, this tension for China between balancing its more activist position in the international rule setting game and in the international system against the risk of irritating, you know, traditional friends, partners and, and others in the region. To me, I kind of see the uh, regional situation with regard to the maritime uh, situation as sort of very much a microcosm of that, if you will. Uh, they're in this unique position of trying to, I think, very genuinely improve relations with the regional neighbors. At the same time, they're very forthrightly uh, pushing and defending the sovereignty issue. Uh, and so do you see that as kind of a test case, if you will, for the bigger, the bigger problem that they'll face ultimately globally? And if so, or even if not, how do you think they're doing uh, in managing them? Oh, absolutely. This is a test case. I, mean, I think a lot, the whole world, not just in Asia, is watching the way that China is behaving. It's, a, it's, it's a, the first case, if you like, of how this powerful, almost superpower China will behave, how it will regard its responsibilities in the world. And I think what you're seeing in the last maybe six months to a year is that China trying to adopt a slightly more sophisticated version of this. Mm. So that in Northeast Asia, uh, they're pushing back very hard against Japan, but they're trying to get on very well with South, South Korea. Korea. And they're being helped by the you know, intense friction there is between Jet, Japan and South Korea, which is one of the underlying trends which is working very much in China's favor. Mm. And then in Southeast Asia, they're <clears throat> pushing back pretty hard against the Philippines, but trying very hard to patch things up to some extent with Vietnam yeah. and, and broadly with Malaysia and Indonesia, which they are doing quite well. Mm. Um, so it's definitely, they've tried to adopt it like a more nuanced strategy, try and have you know, elements of both, it's more assertive China, but also of the charm offensive China. Mm 
But ultimately, it's a little bit self-defeating because even the countries that are on the, the end of the charm offensive at the moment can see that these other countries <laughs> are being pushed around. And so they you know, will think to themselves, you know, that might be me. Japan today, but that could be me tomorrow if I'm not careful. Right. So ultimately, it doesn't really seem like a long-term winning strategy to kind of win the yeah. confidence of those countries. You can't. This is one where you just really can't have it both ways. Right. You mentioned the, the kind of role of the global financial crisis in, in stimulating you know, a, a lot of this. To what degree do you also, I think you mentioned this in the book, you know, the 2009, the drawing of the nine dash line, effectively ripping the mask off, if you will, uh, of some of their intentions. I mean, in my own assessment, that has kind of created that latent hesitancy to buy into the charm offensive in the way that they did in the late 90s period. Um, how big of a role do you see that playing and, and uh, is it something that the, you know, the Chinese talk a lot about moving ahead on the code of conduct but you know as you look at it and you talk to regional players the situation on the water you know uh, doesn't necessarily comport with that so how do you see that? Um, well, well, Clearly, a country like Vietnam is, is glad to try and reduce some of the tensions. I mean, mm -hmm. they don't want to be at, always at loggerheads with China. Mm. But I think you know they, they they clearly see that China hasn't been you know very very um, you know, forefront in trying to push with the code of conduct mm. and generally in trying to establish uh, you know underlying ground rules for how some of these disputes might be solved. And they see the way that China has been much more aggressive with mm. the Philippines. Mm. Um, so you know, clearly they're trying to be more sophisticated and they're having some success, I would say, with you know, Indonesia and Malaysia. But the underlying dynamic still seems to be one where, where China is storing up lots of potential problems for the future. Mm. It's going to be very hard, even if it was successful in undermining the support that the U.S. enjoys in the region, it's going to be very hard to be a, a, an effective leader, if you like, of Asia when it's created so much animosity and so many, so much resentment amongst some of these other countries, which might simply be waiting around for for China to, to you know, to fall on its face in some right. way to, to get their own payback. You yeah. know, th these are deep-seated historical Ocean. resentments on both sides, and so there is no. There's no victory in these things. There only, can only be a sort of, you know, guarded draw. <laughs> no, that makes sense. One of the challenges, I mean, I face it every day in writing uh, on the subject in such a dynamic period. You mentioned Xi Jinping and the way that he's kind of come to the forefront and, and, and you know, actually opens the road to the next installment of, <laughs> of your book. So something for you to think about. But, you know, as you know, my own position is somewhat bullish on, you know, how quickly he would kind of put himself in a solid position in the leadership and some, so on. I have to say that something that has surprised me a little bit is his ability, you know, I think most of us figured that given the challenges and given where they were going with the reform process and so on, they would be very internally focused. But he has managed to uh, to run a fairly adroit foreign policy strategy so far, and especially this clear theme that, that the kind of Biden-Hyde, you know, approach, while not officially dead, you know, certainly uh, is changing. And I think the best way to describe it is sort of, you know, we're still biding our time, but we're not going to hide our strength anymore. Right. Um, and uh, how do you see that? How much of it do you think is personal to Xi? And, you know, how does that affect the U.S. relationship and, and so on? And well, clearly he's, he's, he's personally made a, you know, a great effort to try and restore some stability in U.S.-China relations. He, he, he wanted to, to dial down some of the temperature, yeah. the way that, you know, some of the tensions that had developed with the U.S., even while he's being much tougher with Japan. But I think the... From a foreign policy point of view, I think the interesting thing about Xi is the following. He has this very ambitious economic reform agenda that's mm -hmm. politically treacherous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? The way in which he's going to be able to push these reforms is by taking power and money and future income away from some very powerful actors within the Chinese Communist Party, mm -hmm. especially big state-owned companies. Mm -hmm. The temptation for him, you know, given that that's going to require a huge amount of political capital, the temptation for him will be to play tough on some of these foreign policy issues, sure. especially with Japan. Yeah. Right, that's the real kind of, kind of risk here. If things start to look very difficult mm. on his domestic agenda, then the chances of him ramping up the tensions on mm. some of these territorial disputes start to increase. So yeah. I think that's, even though he seems very much in control, much mm. more control than one could imagine him being, especially at the last few years of the Hu Wen <laughs> era, where it really did feel as if that central leadership was, was really losing some of its purchase yeah. very dramatically. Mm. But there's still, you know, he still has to play this domestic political game, sure. and so that the tendency, mm. the temptation to play tough with some of the neighbors will be very strong. Yeah, I mean, I think it strikes me that's one of the risks in the reform program, both domestically and uh, in some of the reforms, defense structural reform yeah. in particular, that lend themselves to foreign security challenges is the desire or the seeming need because they are so hard and because the vested interest problem is so important to create a sense of crisis or urgency, you know, which then I think runs the risk of tipping over into a real problem. And it, you know, it might actually be part of his worldview. I mean, he's a, 
reformist, authoritarian, nationalist. Mm -hmm. Those seem to be the, the, the three ways I'd describe them. <laughs> An odd mix of characteristics. Uh, but not, not entirely uncommon in, <laughs> no, no. in global affairs at all. And so, but there is that strong nationalist core in his thinking and his worldview, yeah. um, and which he you know, would be quite comfortable playing up at certain times. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, well, let's uh, throw it open to the audience for some questions. And uh, as usual, per CSIS practice, if you would uh, identify yourself, and please do ask a question. Don't engage in a soliloquy. Um, right here up front, we'll start here. Good afternoon. I'm a student here at uh, Johns Hopkins Science, I'm so happy to see a science so and uh, somebody who happened to spend some time in China before coming to the US. Since I've arrived here, something which has surprised, and I'm European also, I should say. So since I've arrived here, something which has surprised me is a little bit this will or this wish from the US to engage on a bilateral basis uh, with China uh, to open uh, avenues of cooperation, conversation on a one-to-one -one basis. And then on the other end, the China tr pushing back this, uh, this, uh, this wish from the US saying that the G20 or the UN are actually the, the right places to have this kind of engagement. So my question is, what do you think might explain the Chinese attitude in this case? Is it a tactical thing or is it, uh, let's say, a genuine agenda they have? So I think there are two different stages to this. I, th I think during the financial crisis, there were some people, not within the administration, but in Washington, who started articulating this idea of a G2, the idea that the US and China would collaborate together to solve these big grinding global problems. First the crisis, but then the environment and all sorts of other issues. And China very clearly said, we are not interested in that. And there's definitely a strain in Chinese thinking that sees that as a trap. It sees that essentially being suckered into playing along with America's rules. It reduces its freedom for action. It, it involves all sorts of responsibilities that China thinks it shouldn't necessarily be, be burdened with at this stage in its development. So the, the G2 idea never got anywhere. But what we've seen more recently is this idea of a, a new type of great power relations is the, the phrase that's usually bandied around, which has come from the Chinese side, but which has been embraced rhetorically by the Obama administration as well. Um, now, it's, it's rhetoric and it's jargon. Maybe we shouldn't read too much into it, but there is a real risk with the US um, embracing this, is that it seem to be, seems to a lot of people in the region as if it's ceding to Chinese ideas, that it's, it's, uh, that it's making it seem as if the US Economy. is saying, well, we will allow you to become kind of a much more important leadership role in Asia, and we will take a much, much, much more of a backseat role. They've allowed the, the China to frame the way this issue is described in certain ways. Now, they have a good reason for that, and the way the US, the reason the US has embraced this concept is because it very much wants to try and find a way to unpick this sense of inevitability that the US and China will end up in conflict, and that's the underlying idea. But you have to be very careful with it, because it can, it can give the impression to lots of other people in Asia that actually you're taking more of a back seat, that you're leading from behind, that you're disengaging. All the kind of conversation one hears about the US and the Middle East, mm -hmm. this phrase is a way where those kinds of ideas can be injected into the debate in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so it has to be handled very delicately. Up here in the front again. Sorry. It's <laughs> CSIS exercise. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Did you see the Nicholas sorry, Christoph? Can you identify yourself? Please? Oh, I'm sorry, you grind staff. Did you see the Nicholas Kristof article about China had once a short, sharp war with Japan over the Sakaku Daiyu Islands? Um, it's supposed to be from USNI. It is, and it's a phrase from a. Uh, American, senior American intelligence officer with the Pacific Fleet. And what he is alleging, he's saying, is that one of the big military exercises last year uh, that the Chinese conducted was really a way of preparing, of training for an invasion of the Senkakus and some of those other islands. Um, now that sounds very dramatic, uh, but it maybe shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Um, and one way to think about it would be that the Chinese have been training to invade Taiwan for 20, you know, for 20 years, right? But they haven't actually done it. So we need to you know, be very careful in distinguishing between a training exercise that, was, that you know, dovetails with some of their you know, broader uh, you know, objectives and the, the, conflict, the, the, the dispute they're involved in at the moment. That's very different from an actual plan to actually conduct it. So he said that in a way that's very uh, attractive to newspapers. I suspect <laughs> we will probably be writing a story about it as well. But you know, I wouldn't want to. You know, we have to be very careful and say that doesn't mean to say that the Chinese are going to plant a flag on the Senkaku Islands tomorrow, and that's a, that's very much not the case. Mm 
in the middle there. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Andre Sovajo, and I'm the chief representative in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company in Detroit and one of President Obama's presidential partners. So my question is, um, do you believe that that in order to you know, stimulate Beijing to become more pragmatic and opt for peaceful coexistence within, for example, compliance with the law of the sea of 1982, the uh, United Nations. Do you believe that the president, our president, President Obama, should take a somewhat harder line with China and, um, you know, send stronger signals that while we want a good relationship, we'd we're just not going to tolerate going into the exclusive economic zones of the Philippines and Vietnam and others. And, and if so, if you do believe he should take a harder line, do you have any specific recommendations as to the kinds of adjustments policy-wise he could make? Um, I don't want to use the phrase harder line, but I would say they do sometimes need to be firmer in the way they respond. Um, and I you know, very much want to draw that distinction from, you know, it can be too aggressive or too offensive and it has to be responding to things that do appear to be legitimately provocative. Um, you know, the things that the US could do would be more sort of freedom of navigation operations in some of these seas, M more things that play into this idea that there are common goods that the US is defending, that it's not actually getting involved in territorial disputes, but it's, it's defending underlying sense of rules and of common goods that, that the US is backing. Um, so that would be the kind of broad comment, but it does have to be you know, very sensitive in the way it does that. And you know, Vietnam is one of those countries that, that demonstrates that. I mean, they have an incredibly complicated, complex, delicate relationship with China. It's both full of historical animosity and tension, but it's also quite close cooperation in lots of ways as well. And so the US can potentially have a closer relationship with a country like Vietnam as one way of you know, generating a sense of deterrence against China, but it can push too far because that would be an incredibly provocative thing towards China. David. Uh, David Lynch with Bloomberg. Jeff, has China's increasing uh, assertiveness in the maritime sector had any visible economic consequences so far? Has it affected <clears throat> pardon me, trade and investment flows, uh, the activities of Japanese multinationals, Philippine companies, etc. Uh, and to whatever extent it has, do you expect a, a greater impact going forward? Uh, well, absolutely. When it comes to Japan, there has been uh, a discernible impact already. Uh, I don't have the figures on top of my head, but you can see a very strong shift of Japanese companies looking you know, for other markets, looking for other uh, places, particularly in Southeast Asia, to invest rather than in China. And that is an incredibly dynamic and strong relationship, the one between China and Japan. Uh, there's something like trade of about $350 billion per year. It's one of the biggest trading relationships in the world. So that already is a, you know, a very important impact. But beyond that, for other countries, it, there hasn't really been too discernible an impact yet. And you're still seeing you know, very strong you know, Chinese investments and financing to countries in Southeast Asia and other parts of the region. Uh, so you're, you're still seeing China expanding, if you like, its economic influence in most other countries, but the exception being Japan, where there's already a big dip. Up front here, you have a question? Uh, Bill Tucker, uh, I've done a lot of work on China, and I'd like uh, for you to uh, comment on China's one child policy. Uh, I've seen many instances of uh, a set of parents, two set of grandparents uh, over a child in a department store uh, for the child's having a fit because they can't uh, get what they want. So they're, they're raising a bunch of spoiled brats in the country. And how's that going to affect the country and, uh, and its progress? Um, well, as a parent of a single child family, I'm in a <laughs> unique position to comment on this. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a couple of, couple of things. First of all is that the one-child policy for many, if not most, Chinese is no longer a reality and hasn't been for a long time. Ethnic groups, rural areas, lots of different people in cities have for some time been able to have at least two kids and there have been relaxations more recently. Um, indeed, some, some of the criticisms that people would make of the one-child policy is that uh, prosperity and development would have achieved the same demographic results without the very harsh uh, 
uh, you know, brutal way that the one-child policy was imposed. I mean, it's just a sort of natural order of things that as countries and people become wealthier and more secure, they have fewer children. And that has happened in China, even amongst the people who are allowed to have more than one child. But in terms of your question about you know, sort of spoiled kids, I mean, that is, that does capture a certain amount of reality about you know, the way the Chinese families are, maybe behaved compared to, to other countries. But then the flip side of that is an incredibly ambitious, you know, really sort of dynamic young kids who, who have all this attention and are, you know, they are, their whole family's attention is focused on them. And so they're absolutely desperate to get ahead and get an education, come to the States to get an education. So the flip side of it is this really sort of almost overwhelming sense of ambition that you get when you meet young Chinese people, which is almost one of the, one of the most striking things about living in the country is this mm -hmm. sense of possibilities and of opportunities that this, this generation of young Chinese um, often feel about their lives. In the back there. Ingo Zamperoni with ARD German Public Television. Um, you said in your opening remarks that China has changed in the last couple of years as, as you know, behaving like a great power is trying to assert itself. And I was wondering how much that is a government issued stance and how much the Chinese people are backing that because it seems to me that as soon as they, you just said, you know, they try to have an education and stuff, as soon as they can, if they have the means, they try to flee the country. They come to the U.S. The, the immigration of Chinese to this country has increased immensely over the past years. And um, so, in, back to the title of your book, how much is that really a contest then uh, of the uh, century between China and the U.S. if China is somewhat corroding from inside, unless that's the wrong perception I have? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I, w I wouldn't necessarily interpret the huge numbers of Chinese who come here to get an education as a sense that China's corroding, um, or, to be, or to say that it's a contrast with this idea of a more ambitious, strident foreign policy. And you'd often, oftentimes you find that some of the young Chinese who come here to get educated often end up being some of the more nationalistic people that you, that you come across. Uh, some of that internet nationalism that you, is very strident and strong in China often comes from some of these kids who've been educated overseas and returned home. It becomes part of the sense of identity that they develop while they're overseas. They become, oftentimes you find them becoming more patriotic. And more, more generally, it seems to me that this is the fact that so many Chinese kids are so ambitious that they want to come here and be educated is a very good thing for China. It's a huge resource of people that you are seeing more and more of them going back because there are good opportunities in China. They've learned all sorts of skills that they might have learned in the Chinese education system here. So they're, you know, they're a real potential asset and strength for China. They're not necessarily, as you're suggesting, as a sign that China is eroding. Um, but there definitely is that, that aspect to the Chinese elite as well. I mean, you're seeing huge numbers of rich people trying to get passports, foreign passports, trying to have their kids have foreign passports or apartments overseas. And that just tells you, I think, something more about Edu the insecurity about the political system, the mm -hmm. sense that you know, they do think things have gone very well, their lives have got a lot better, but there is this fear that you know, potentially the system could turn against them if they, you know, they made the wrong friends or the wrong business deal, and so they, they want an insurance policy. So that does tell you something that behind the, this very confident, self-assured China that we sometimes see, there is actually quite a, a deep sense of insecurity, both at the government level and amongst you know, even very successful people as well. In the back there. <coughs> Uh, Wang Gunghua from Chinese Embassy, and um, about the U.S. Uh, pivot strategy. Uh, do you think uh, in the recent years there are some disputes ar arise in Asia Pacific, including the maritime disputes? Do you think, to some extent, the U.S. pivot strategy help encourage some regional countries to take a harder line? on the maritime disputes to China? And do you think, uh, because uh, I know uh, US public always are critical of the administration's pol policy, but on pivot policy strategy, do you think US need to reconsider some elements in it and to, to make it a better one? And the second question is, even US pivot to Asia Pacific in the recent years, but still, I think U.S.-China relations keep stable, and the mutual dialogue and mutual exchange between different levels are, are there, keeping the momentum. So what, uh, what would you uh, assess the future effect of the pivot strategy to the bilateral relations between U.S. and China? 
Well, thank you very much. Two very interesting questions. Um, I think you've definitely pinpointed one of the, the real risks with a, a very, you know, with a, uh, the US strategy in Asia is that by trying to up its game, by trying to say that we are going to be a long-term presence there, that it does encourage some of its allies to be overly ambitious, overly aggressive. And you could make a case that that has been the case with the Philippines, for instance. Um, I think the Japan situation is a lot more complicated, but definitely I think you could say that some of the things that the Philippines has done have been overly bold because they think that the US is going to have their back. And then they've been very disappointed to find out that the US didn't necessarily have their back. And going long term, that's definitely one of the underlying risks for the US is that it, it gets sucked into other people's conflicts rather than being the, being the sort of backstop to those countries from being pushed around by China. Um, your second question about US-China relations. Uh, there's clearly a huge kind of bureaucratic effort on both countries to, to find ways to have a more stable relationship that SNED brings together you know, hundreds of officials and in, in a, they seem to get together to talk. And there are, the numbers of connections are very strong. But it does feel like it's on a slightly thin fabric. There's what the, uh, the US, if, that, if that kind of relationship is going to develop in a more coherent way, there needs to be common projects, things that the US and China are doing together that the governments feel they get benefit from and that they can tell both of their societies that they get benefit from. And the obvious one that people in this country have been excited about is, is cooperation on environmental issues, perhaps of shale gas. That would be a very interesting one to watch in the next few years. But I think you do need to see some success stories, some real kind of policy achievements uh, to buttress that relationship. Otherwise, there are lots of political pressures in both countries that could pull it apart relatively quickly. In the center here. My name is uh, Kunio Kikuchi, and I'm with uh, Washington Research and Analysis. Uh, going back to your title about contest, I think the biggest contest might be that of uh, between U.S. and China, might be that of uh, the form of government. Uh, it seems that if uh, U.S. today has a kind of government that is the ultimate form, multi-party, uh, democratic, and uh, uh, decision-making system that is open to the public, uh, then the government form of China, single party communist, uh, was very opaque uh, decision making. And if you see the photos of the once in a few year central party meeting, it's mostly men and all, also senior people, a lot of them. I think that form of government uh, may not be sustainable. And I was wondering uh, when and how China might change its government into a multi-party system the way they have already in Hong Kong, or let's say in Taiwan, and of course Japan and Korea. Thank you. Uh, well, there's an easy question to answer. Um, <laughs> Softball there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'd say I half agree and half disagree with you. Um, in terms of what I describe as the contest, one of the striking things to me is how much of it is not as ideological as we often assume. If China was a democracy, it would be doing a lot of the things that it's doing at the moment. Maybe um, doing more. Doing anyway, maybe even more. It might be even more nationalistic in lots of ways. Um, but the underlying motivations for China to do these things are much more rooted in the fact that it is now this great power that wants to shape the world to its interests and, and less about its own particular form of government. However, I think you've, you have hit um, you know, a very important point, which is that in the long run, I think you know, one of the underlying advantages the US has is that in 20 years' time, we all know how the American president will be elected in 20 years' time. We can have no idea about how power will be transferred in China in 20 years' time. And one of the things we can say that is we don't really know why and how Xi Jinping was chosen two years ago. Uh, here's now the man who's the second most powerful leader in the world. And we knew five years beforehand that he would be Chinese president. But we don't still actually know why. Again, Chris could talk to you all day about some of the, the guesses that we have and educated guesses they would be. But we don't really know the political coalitions that were, were, they made that decision. We don't even know who made that decision. Was it the, the nine people then on the standing committee? Was it the central committee? Was it the Politburo? So these huge core issues about how political power is exercised and transferred in China that we, we still don't know a lot about and which will become even harder going forward. So you know, that, that very much so is one of the kind of big weaknesses, if you like, that China faces uh, in the sense of uh, this being a long-term contest for, for relevance and viability. Right here in the front. 
Hi, I'm Sung Jin Kim, uh, visiting fellow of CSIS. Uh, China has hosted six party talks to uh, manage the denuclearization of North Korea and Korean Peninsula. Uh, recently, but the relation between China and North Korea has been estranged, especially the, since the execution of Jang Song Tae by North Korean leader Kim Jong Un. So, what do you think about the prospect of China's policy against North Korea and the cooperation or policy with the U.S.? Clearly, there are things happening in, in Chinese policy towards North Korea, um, and this was was apparent even before uh, Jiang Tsun Sek was was executed, uh, but even more so since then because he was, as you mentioned, he was wasn't just the sort of uh, you know force behind the throne, but he was considered to be the conduit for for Beijing with with new leader with this new regime in North Korea. But I might still suspect that the bottom line for China is what it has been for the last couple of decades, and which has guided their policy, which is they, they still see North Korea as this buffer state. They don't want the regime to collapse. They don't want implosion of North Korea. They don't want a hasty unification that would potentially bring US forces up to the Chinese border, or in some you know, chaotic situation, Chinese and US forces maybe coming together in some way. So I think, still think they, their bottom line is still ultimately they want to maintain as long as they can the viability of the regime, even though they're incredibly uncomfortable and incredibly uh, put out at some of the recent turn of events in North Korea. Woman over here in the corner. Okay, just wait for the microphone, please. Thank you very much. I'm Susan Weld at Georgetown Law Center. And this is what I wonder. I remember when Zhang Bijian had his harmonious rise theory, and there were, I believe, a number of people in the military who were not pleased with that kind of rise. Do we, are we seeing a unified sort of rejection of the Zhang Bijian attitude in foreign policy, or is it something different? So the way I describe it is to go back to this idea that actually, in some ways, China has two different strategies. It has this get on with the neighbors economic integration strategy, which is the formalization of Jiang you know, peaceful rise, peaceful development. And then this different, more military strategy about strategic space, about getting control over maritime areas, about pushing the US back. Uh, so you haven't seen the end of it, but it is, as I say, there are two contradictory strategies. And the fact that the military one is so much more prominent now is undermining the foundations of that one. But it's still very much part of how Chinese government would describe its strategy of how they would like to think about the world, but they're, but they're, they're, they're trying to have it both ways in a sense, and then they're not able to. In the back there. Uh, Nicholas Weinstein, Red Cross volunteer. I was uh, wondering about your, uh, your thoughts on the charm offensive with the economy versus the uh, military aggression, or, yeah. Anyway, um, I was wondering, is this uh, somewhat of a carrot and stick uh, method, so the, uh, they use the economy to uh, charm people and then the military to uh, get more of their way, or is, and is it the case that uh, as the carrot grows, the stick will get bigger as well? I'm sorry, I missed that last, last, just the last part of your question. Will it be the case that as the carrot or the economy grows, that the stick will also get bigger? Uh, well, definitely, that is that is part of the dynamic. I mean, China is trying to expand its influence by um, you know, integrating these countries in more closely with its economy. It's trying to become the central reference point for e economic interactions in the region, uh, and that will continue on and will become, as long as the economy keeps growing at a relative high rate, that will become more and more powerful as time goes on. Um, but your second question about whether or not they're going to have a bigger stick or not, I mean, that's a much harder question to to answer, as I, as I suspect, it might depend to some extent on the political temperature of what's happening in Beijing. I mean, if the economy were to slow, or if the reform process were to get tied up, and Xi Jinping was to find himself in a very tricky domestic situation, then you might see them having using a, a bigger stick in some of these disputes. There'd be a temptation to do that, but I don't think there's a, a sign necessarily that they have a deliberate strategy at the moment to to get tougher. I, mean, I think what they're trying to do is a slightly more focused thing where they're being more pushing back against Japan, but being nice to South Korea, pushing back in the Philippines, but trying to get on with Vietnam and Indonesia and Malaysia and some of these other countries. That seems to be the, the way they're thinking about things at the moment. OK, I think we have time for one more question. Hey, up here. Hey, okay. 
Uh, it's Julian Lee from CSIS. Uh, I bought your, your book. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very key question. Uh, what's the biggest business opportunity and the biggest risk in the 10 year between China and uh, United States? Thank you. Biggest opportunity and risk? Um, I think actually one of the real, really interesting and not very commented on issues is the potential for Chinese investment in this country. Um, and I think it's very important for the US for two reasons. One, because the US needs the money, um, <laughs> not to be too blunt on it. But the second is there seems to be very good, interesting politics for the US. One of the, the great problems the US has had is trying to have leverage within the Chinese system. Uh, the US has all these interest groups that can be addressed directly, but the, the Communist Party seems outside to be this kind of unified, coherent whole, and it's very hard to, to get constituencies of support within the system. Uh, the way to do that would be to have very big, important, powerful Chinese companies operating freely within this country. And I'm thinking not just about private businesses, but big state-owned companies. Um, if, you, if you think about you know, the, the US relations with China, the, the biggest lobby that Beijing has had within the US system has always been multinational companies. That's slightly gone down a little bit in recent years because the, the Chinese authorities have had a kind of tougher relationship with multinationals, but that still very much holds true. They have been often been the people who've come in and tried to push whichever administration it is to take slightly softer line with China. And if the US wants to have leverage in, within the Chinese system, that's one way to kind of get hold of it, to get a little break, to build up a constituency of support amongst, particularly amongst big SOE bosses that can give you some sort of influence over the system. And just one example of that would be Iran sanctions policy. Uh, China has generally cooperated quite effectively with the US over the Iran sanctions. One of the reasons maybe for that is actually a couple of big oil companies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By and large, we'll say. A couple of big oil companies are now operating here, and so it does mean that they're exposed to legal risk and that they're susceptible to American political pressure in ways they wouldn't necessarily have been before. Okay, well, Jeff, uh, obviously we can continue this all day. <laughs> Thanks so much for uh, coming by, and uh, I do encourage people to buy the book, and please uh, interact with Jeff uh, while he's here for a few more minutes. Uh, please join me in thanking Jeff for his presentation. Thank you very much, Jeff. Nice job. Well done. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> I should turn this off. Yeah. <laughs>